Hey everyone, welcome back to another GCSE History Revision Tutorial and today we are going to focus on the early years of the Nazi party. So when we're looking at the rise of the Nazis it really helps if we divide it into three phases. In this tutorial we're going to look at the period 1919 to 1922. We'll call this the early years of the party. This is when the DAP, or German Workers' Party, is first set up and Hitler takes control of it. In another tutorial, you can look at the period 1923 to 1929, which we'll call the Lean Years of the Party. And there's another tutorial for the period 1930 to 1933, when the Nazis win power. So let's zoom in on those early years of the party between 1919 and 1922. The party was set up in February of 1919 called the DAP or German Workers' Party and remember it wasn't created by Hitler. It was founded by this man Anton Drexler in the southern part of Germany, Bavaria, in the city of Munich. And in those early days the party was almost irrelevant. It had very little support and funding. Hitler joined the party in December of 1919, having been attracted by some of the party's ideas. And he then took control of the party. In this tutorial, we'll look at five steps towards that. We'll look at the 25-point programme, Hitler's personal appeal, his reorganisation of the party, his takeover of the party leadership, and his creation of the SA. Then in 1922, a party conference was held. At that conference, party members voted to give up their right to elect the leader. In other words, they could no longer remove and replace Hitler. The party was effectively now his. So let's look at how Hitler took control of the party and reorganised it. We'll start with the 25-point programme. When Hitler first joined the DAP, he was attracted to some of its ideas. It was anti-Weimar, it was anti-democracy, and it was an anti-Jewish party. Hitler became head of party propaganda, and in that role he began to take control of party policies. He did this by working alongside Anton Drexler, the party leader, to write the 25-point programme. This was a collection of 25 policies or promises which the party offered. As we start to look at what was actually in the 25 point programme, it's important to remember this key point. The programme was a mix of both nationalist and socialist policies, and we'll look at both. We'll look first at the nationalist policies. And firstly, here's a reminder of what nationalism is. It's a set of political beliefs focused on putting the needs of your own country and race first. Usually, it means making your country stronger and more independent by building up its power, empire and army. Now, there were lots of nationalist policies in the 25-point programme, and here are some of them. In point one, the party promised a greater Germany. This meant retaking all the land and population which Germany had lost in the Versailles Treaty. In point two, the party promised to cancel the Versailles Treaty and all its punishments and restrictions. In point three, the party called for Germany to have an empire land and colonies with which to feed and settle its growing population. In point four, the party stated that only those of German blood could be citizens. That meant Jews would not be citizens and would not have the same rights. And in point 25, the party stated that Germany should have a strong central government. This probably meant some form of dictatorship rather than democracy. Now these nationalist ideas were particularly popular with party activists from the rural southern areas of Germany 
like Bavaria, including, for example, Hitler himself. Next, let's look at some of the socialist policies of the party. Now, socialism is a set of political beliefs focused on the state doing more to look after the welfare of its citizens and to end inequality between them. It usually involves bringing the economy and industry under the control of the workers or the government. Now, there were many socialist policies included in the 25 point programme. Here are some of them. In point 14, the party stated that big industries must share their profits with their workers. In point 15, the party called for the state to provide more generous old age pensions to look after the elderly. In point 17, the party promised to seize land from wealthy landowners for the good of the people. In point 20, the party called for education of gifted children to be paid for by the state so that even poor families could have their children educated to a high standard. And in point 21, the party stated that the state would protect the health of mothers and their children, for example, by providing physical exercise in schools. Now, these socialist ideas were popular with party activists from the urban northern areas of Germany, such as Goebbels. So as we've seen, the 25 point programme was a mixture of nationalist and socialist ideas. And this really matters because firstly, it meant that the party began to attract support from different groups in society. Some were attracted by the nationalist policies and others were attracted to the party's socialist ideas. Secondly, it mattered because it led to future splits within the party between those who preferred the nationalist policies and those who preferred the socialist policies. In the tutorial on the lean years of the party, you can look at how that split developed and how Hitler solved it at the Bamberg conference. Another factor in Hitler's growing control of the party was his personal appeal. Hitler's personal appeal was crucial in the early days of the party. He recognised the importance of public speaking and therefore focused on improving his public speaking skills. He rehearsed his performances carefully often taking photographs of his poses and deciding which ones were more effective. When he came to speak, his voice began quietly and slowly, and he built up to a passionate, frenzied and very persuasive rage. He used gestures too. He started by leaning in towards his audience, fixing his eyes on them and building up to waving his hands vigorously in the air. He had publicity photos and paintings produced to further this image of himself as an inspirational speaker. And very soon he began to attract large audiences. He regularly appeared as the star speaker at early Nazi meetings. Let's watch him in action for a moment. <laughs> Vielleicht wird manch unter Ihnen sein, der es mir nicht verzeihen kann, dass ich die marxistischen Parteien vernichtete. Aber mein Freund, ich habe die anderen genauso vernichtet. Sie sind Now, the fact that Hitler was such a powerful public speaker really mattered. His personal appeal had two important consequences for the party. First of all, it attracted many new members to the party. As you can see, membership leapt to about 50,000 by 1923. And these new members brought with them new finance. Membership fees increased and the party earned more money to spend. 
Secondly, Hitler's personal appeal increased his influence over the party. The new members who joined the party were mostly Hitler's followers. They were attracted to the party because of him and they were loyal to him. And that gave him an important power base within the party. Another action taken by Hitler in this period was to start reorganising the party. As the party's leader of propaganda, Hitler introduced a number of key changes from 1920 onwards. Let's look at them. Firstly, he set up a permanent office in Munich with a full-time administrator, Rudolf Schussler, to handle the party's paperwork. This mattered because it meant that meetings were now better organised and advertised. As a result, attendance at meetings increased, and so too did the party's funding. Hitler changed the name of the party to the National Socialist German Workers' Party, NSDAP or Nazi Party. This mattered too because the new name made the party's principles very clear. The new name also had a broad appeal to different groups in society. Nationalists, socialists and workers were all attracted. Hitler introduced a swastika logo for the party and a straight arm salute. This mattered because it made the party instantly recognisable. It was now easy to distinguish the Nazis from other nationalist parties. Using their new funding, the party bought a newspaper, the Volkische Beobachter or People's Observer. This newspaper enabled the party to spread its propaganda messages to a wider audience. Hitler's next step was to strengthen his leadership of the party. From July 1921, he brought the party under his control. Firstly, he challenged Drexler to a leadership contest. Now, because many of the party members had been attracted to the party by Hitler and were loyal to him, Drexler lost the contest and Hitler became party leader. He then moved to put his supporters into key positions in the party, and he chose them carefully for their skills, image and loyalty. Rudolf Hess, a wealthy academic, became his deputy. Hermann Goering, a dashing, wealthy World War I pilot, helped to give the party an image of respectability. Julius Streicher, a publisher, helped to bring the party knowledge over how to use the press, and he later founded a second Nazi newspaper, Der Stürmer. Ernst Röhm, an ex-army officer who was popular with ex-soldiers, was put in charge of Hitler's paramilitary force, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Finally, let's look at Hitler's creation of the SA, or Sturmabteilung, in 1921. Now, Hitler did this just one month after becoming leader, which suggests he viewed it as a priority. The SA, or stormtroopers, were a paramilitary force. This means they were a private army for the Nazi party. Many of them were thugs. They were mostly unemployed ex-soldiers and students and potentially they were very difficult to control. But they played a key role in strengthening the Nazi party and Hitler personally. And to understand this, let's look at some of the key features of the SA. Firstly, they marched in the streets wearing brown uniforms. And that mattered because it made the party look organised, disciplined, tough and strong. Particularly in the early years of the Weimar Republic, when the Republic was quite unstable and there was a great deal of political chaos. Secondly, the SA guarded Nazi party meetings, and that mattered because it protected Nazi speakers and subdued or stamped down any opposition to Hitler. Thirdly, the SA attacked meetings of other parties. That mattered because it disrupted the other parties' campaigns, particularly the communists. Attacking meetings of the Communist Party brawling with them and beating them up in the streets, gave the Nazi party a reputation of being strongly anti-communist, 
and this was important particularly to Germans who were scared of the Communist Party's ideas. Fourthly, the SA were placed under the control of one of Hitler's closest, most loyal colleagues, Ernst Röhm. That mattered because it meant that Hitler could rely on the obedience and loyalty of the SA. Finally, the most trusted members of the SA were chosen to become Hitler's shock troop or bodyguards. That mattered because it protected Hitler from potential assassination. So now we've come to the end of the tutorial, it's the ideal time for you to look back at your knowledge organiser and go through highlighting anything that we've covered. It would be a good idea to test yourself on what we've done, or maybe ask somebody at home to test you. Thanks for watching this tutorial everyone. Of course there are lots more tutorials on our YouTube channel. So check it out and don't forget to subscribe.